Great. So why are we even talking about awards? Well, because they're, of course, just one kind of reward or incentive. Um, and the existence of awards really signals that something is valuable. So when it's being given, you know, the institution or the person or the agency, whoever is giving an award is basically saying this work matters and we want to see more work like it. And, you know, uh, the the landscape report on inclusive SciComm by Katie Canfield and Sunshine Menezes actually pointed out as one of the things that's really crucial um, for building a movement of inclusive SciComm is to have a reward and incentive system that really values inclusive SciComm. And so, um, you know, we wanted to really build on this work in understanding, well, how what could that look like? What's one piece of it in terms of awards? Um, our team focused most closely on um, thinking about how awards could shift the culture of science toward one that increasingly values inclusive SciComm. And for now, at least, we're most specifically focused on the awards that scientific societies and professional associations give out. Um, and, and what we mean by societies is, you know, the organizations that are generally they hold conferences and publish journals, among other things, um, in a particular field. And we're focusing on these kinds of awards for a few reasons. One is that um, associations and societies represent large numbers of researchers. Um, usually in a single discipline. And so in a lot of ways, their members will sort of share a professional culture. Um, and also these uh, organizations are generally very well regarded by researchers. So when they give out awards, those awards really have the potential to carry a significant amount of weight and prestige, um, which you know, makes them very potentially at least influential. So um, we have a few research questions and today we'll be sharing um, just for the first time, actually, some of the research we've been doing on this topic. And we're really eager also to hear from you some of your thoughts and experiences around science communication awards. Um, so our first question is really to what extent do society's existing awards recognize inclusive SciComm? To answer this question, we um, generated a a list of awards that societies offer. We came up with 78 of them in areas of public engagement, science communication, advocacy, outreach, community science or knowledge co-creation, and even some in the humanitarian space, really anything that we felt could be related to communication. And we pulled the text from all of their websites where they talked about the awards and analyzed the way um, the criteria and the awards themselves were being described. So we kind of looked for the presence or absence of different, um, different categories related to eligibility, um, what the awards come with, whether it's an application or a nomination, what it entails, what kind of work is being recognized. We really tried to understand all sides of, of the awards. Um, and then we looked for patterns across the 78 that we found. Um, we especially uh, paid attention to um, whether there were any mentions of things that we would associate with prioritizing inclusive SciComm based on the landscape analysis. So terms that were related to the key traits like reflexivity, intentionality or reciprocity, or emphasis on communicating with diverse audiences or audiences who have been rep uh, underrepresented or excluded from science. Um, and whether the organization was prioritizing diversity in who they give the award to as well. So that was the first set of questions. Um, oops, our second set of questions, sorry about that lag, is um, our second question is, uh, how do society's science communication awards impact the recipients their peers and their institutions. So what we mean by this is when you know someone receives an award for some kind of science communication, um, what changes as a result? Does it affect the recipient's career, the science communication work they go on to do afterwards? Does it affect them on a personal level? And do we have any indication that it might affect their peers or the institutions they're at? And then the second question here, is um, what are the opportunities for society's awards to better support the inclusive SciComm movement going forward? So what could be changed about them? Or is it different components that the awards come with or who they're given to or how the societies communicate about the awards themselves or their recipients? 
really anything that could make the impact even greater. So to answer these questions, we conducted interviews where we pulled the list of recipients of those 78 awards from the past 10 years and um, kind of randomly within each award invited recipients to um, have an interview with us and then asked them to sort of paint a picture of their science communication work and what motivates them to do it, what they hope to achieve, um, and lots about the award experience themselves, if they had applied or been nominated, um, sort of what it was like to receive the award, the award and, and any impacts they might attribute to, um, to receiving it, as well as ideas they had for making the awards more impactful. So all of these interviews were recorded, and then the three of us analyzed all of them, pulling out the themes and the insights that could help give us an understanding um, of these three research questions. So um, before I launch into what we've learned, we wanted to be clear about who these participants were. And, and we had um, 28 interviews, uh, 26 of those participants did respond to our demographic questions. So we almost know the demographics for everyone. Um, and because we sort of pseudo randomly sampled among the pool of recipients, we do expect that our, our sample um, reflects the, the actual award winners pretty well, though it may not be a perfect reflection of who's received these awards. Um, and then I also want to note that we generally gave people open ended boxes for demographics. So I'll show a summary where we've um, binned some responses, put them together, but we'll talk about uh, what the particular responses were as well. Um, so first we asked uh, how what people's gender were and, and you'll see we had 16 or about 62% of our participants said they were man and or male is how they answered this, um, while 46% said woman and or female. We also asked about ethnicity and we had almost a quarter, 23% who answered one of these, either Hispanic, mixed, Cuban American, Latino, Latina, Latinx, Mexican, um, oh, and Hispanic was on its own, sorry. The first one was as a hyphen, uh, sorry, a slash response. Um, one person who identified as African-American and everybody else who said either Caucasian, white, or European. We asked what kind of institution and role our respondents had, and 73% were at academic institutions. Um, and then we had about 15% in engagement focus roles, so things like science centers or self-employed science communicators, and 12% who are doing research not in academic settings. And then finally, um, trying to understand career stage, we had about 35% who self-identified as early career, um, then a sort of middle section who were either to didn't specify or were, were self-identifying as mid-career and based on titles like retired or distinguished professor, we had about 27% who were later career. So um, what are we learning so far about these awards and their role in the inclusive SciComm movement? Well, first looking at the criteria even to receive the awards. So these are from the way that the, the um, societies themselves describe the awards. First, we found that the criteria were often quite vague um, on the websites, kind of telling people what they needed to do in order to be el to um, be a good applicant for this award. There was not a lot of specificity about what society generally was looking for. Um, in most cases, of course, not in every case, some were actually quite specific. Um, a second finding or kind of theme we have is that most of the awards we looked at are generally recognizing cumulative achievements. By that we mean not specific projects, but rather, you know, somebody who has done a lot of engagement over the course of a career, which of course means the award ends up being geared toward people who are later in their career um, or who have done more visible or prototypical, like writing a popular science book forms of, of public engagement. And then we found pretty few signs of prioritizing inclusivity, diversity, or the particular traits of inclusive science communication, um, as well as not many awards that seem to be at least explicitly prioritizing uh, diversity or, or inclusion or equity um, in who receives the award as well. Um, and then the, the last part we looked at through the content analysis was the actual characteristics of the awards. And we found that most involved nominations rather than individuals necessarily applying. 
Um, though there was kind of a middle ground where some awards were by nomination, but it turned, but many people could either self nominate or ask others. Um, this quote, I was talking to my department head and was like, you know, here's this award. And they're like, oh, like, do you want to be nominated? And I was like, yeah, it was a pretty direct, candid transmission. It was uncomfortable to be in that space, but it kind of naturally occurred. And we think this quote was important for us because not only it showed, you know, one person who went out and asked for the, the nomination, but that that's a difficult thing to do. And we think this has really important implications for who is in the selection pool and ultimately who is um, selected because, you know, quite likely researchers who already have a lot of visibility and prestige in their fields, especially later career researchers and those who are white and male, you know, are more likely to catch their peers' attention and receive a nomination. Um, and that others are maybe more likely to need to ask for a nomination or, um, or to self-nominate when that's an option. Um, so we think this is one important implication and consideration as, um, as we think about the role of awards in supporting inclusive SciComm. And then the other important point we wanted to just note about the characteristics are that some of the awards kind of came with a tangible reward, uh, like a plaque or money, or even special special privileges like being awarded at a ceremony, um, while others were primarily recognition. And we're in the process of looking at how awards with different components have different impacts for the recipients. Um, but I think for now, Emily will speak to some of the general impacts that, that participants told us about in the interviews. Quickly stop sharing my screen to let Emily take over. Great, thank you, Rose. Let me get this set up. And let me know, I'm in the process of a move, so if my internet seems poor at any point, just let me know, I'll try to find a workaround. So, Okay, I think I was in the process of telling you that my internet is slow and then froze. So <laughs> let's get that back up. Um, get back to the presentation. Okay. So yes, as I think I was saying, I don't know how much you heard, but I'm in the process of a move. So if at any point it freezes or you lose me, let me know um, and I'll try to get it back up and running. Um, so this part should be pretty short um, since we're really focused more on these kind of institutional and the cultural impacts of awards, if, if there seem to be any. Um, what I focus on is what respondents said personally they felt was the impact, whether um, in more sort of an intrinsic way or something really tangible on the ground. So almost everyone we talked to um, mentioned feeling really honored, um, often surprised, but really appreciative that they had received this recognition. And then in some cases, we saw that it was um, a confidence boost or many people actually use the term sort of fuel, green light that told them, you know, you're on the right track, uh, whether they were gonna continue on that track anyways, um, but it gave them sort of a boost. So you can see, here's an example, um, someone feeling like it really did help their confidence. And in this case, um, they said since it, even though it came kind of late in their career, what it, it did come and help their confidence and what I was doing, it helped me realize that maybe my sense of marginality to the field was originally misplaced. Um, so I thought that was sort of interesting, this idea that even in hindsight, um, it can help them sort of recreate the story of what they contribute to their field. And then we saw, especially for people who were in earlier in their career, saying things like, well, you know, these awards are like fuel, so it's nice to be recognized, but it's also nice to know there's a community out there worrying about the same things that I'm worried about and it just keeps you going. I don't think it's changed the way I do things or my commitment to it, but it fills up the tank again. And we saw this quite often that they're saying, you know, I already knew I was taking sort of an alternative path or this, um, this thing that maybe was going to be difficult, but this was renewing and recharging in a way that really mattered for me. Um, I just wanna offer one more. I think it's really useful, um, especially since we are looking at science communication engagement awards, but this was from a respondent who was trained as a physicist and then moved into science communication um, more and more throughout their career. And basically saying, you know, for 
them, this award actually became their guidepost for what, how they would know if they were doing the right thing in science communication. And they had a list of the awardees and they were all very prestigious physicists. They're like, okay, this is, you know, what I'm going to use. And then when they ended up actually on their award, I'm like, all right, well done. Let's, <laughs> let's keep doing this. It seems to be working. Um, so that narrative of guideposts, of fuel, um, of a green light came up um, many times. The other thing uh, that came up that was a little bit more surprising because in almost all these cases, the awards went to an individual. But what came up very often when people were talking is different forms of connection that they felt grew or were strengthened by the award. So in one case, like in the example um, that I just shared of the recipient who used that list of uh, other recipients as sort of their guidepost for what good communication looked like, um, there's often this feeling of a connection to the other awardees, both past and present. So here's an example. Um, Probably the most rewarding thing to me, this is one that said, was just having my name be affiliated with all those previous award winners who are just so incredible, really put me in a different frame of mind. So we saw that narrative come up a few times, um, a feeling like you join a community by being uh, given this award and that recognition. Another one that was interesting, especially because these awards were, um, I think in almost all cases, two individuals, is many people actually said, you know, I viewed this award as an award for what my field, my collaborators, um, people like me are doing. So here's an example from a researcher in South America who says, everything I do is teamwork. So having someone, let's say from Brazil, getting this important award is a recognition, not only to me, but to what we do here in Brazil. It's a group award for everyone who works with these areas, which are usually not highly recognized. So it's good, they see it then as having these impacts potentially for everyone who is similar to them or connected to them in some way. And then the last piece, um, which came up um, probably similarly often is this idea of the award actually helping someone realize that they were connected to their field or to the particular um, awarding science society um, or to just you know a particular type of scientific research more broadly. So you saw that a little bit in that first quote of the respondent who said it helped help them feel less marginalized in their field. And here's one from, um, one of our interviewees who chose a very different career path, uh, left academia entirely early career. Um, and she mentioned that the award made her feel much more connected, particularly because of her previous experience being told so often by different professors. She said that what you're doing doesn't matter, it's not valuable. And all of a sudden this award not only connected her to people, but gave her that, that recognition that yes, what you're doing is valuable. Um, and she already knew that, but it was helpful to have others recognize it as well, made her sort of feel reconnected to this um, scientific community that she had sort of lost, touched with her, felt like an outsider. Um, so moving now to what sort of more tangible impacts that respondents could point to, um, most respondents said it did not impact their career or their particular life path. So here's a pretty classic quote, everyone <laughs> would say, oh, it's so great, I appreciate I was so surprised and honored that I got this award, uh, but it didn't really change anything that I've noticed. And sometimes that was because they were gonna continue on that path anyways. Um, often awards were given to people who are pretty far along in their career. And so they were already past tenure. If they're in academia, they were already pretty set on their path, they felt, um, and it didn't, it didn't lead to any tangible change um, in what they did or, or how they did it or what others, gave them space to do. Um, the exception, and I think in this the um, data that Rose was showing, you'll see we had a, a large chunk of early career uh, researchers who were in our pool, and that was our recipients who were in our pool, and that was partly because we started to notice early on uh, that there were some differences among people if they received the award early in their career, so we started to oversample um, those respondents, and you'll see that they actually almost all early career recipients did say that it had an impact. So that was where we started to notice some variation is out of this larger pool of people who are like, oh yeah, it was great, but didn't do much on the ground. That was not the case at all for early career recipients. And this quote, I think this was someone in academia and they said they got it 
right before going up for tenure and it they're sure it helped um particularly because it gave them justification to say you know i can do all of it i can do the research the teaching the service um in these discussions where people often were saying don't do this if you want to be a tenured faculty member and that that um those types of discussions of people saying don't do this because it's going to hurt your career especially people in academia um, we heard that a lot from respondents that that narrative was still pretty strong so i'll turn it over to naveen now so we can get into more of what the engagement looked like in the institutional impact. All right, thank you, Emily. Um, so in the interviews, we were looking at, uh, as Rose was saying, uh, some of the ex inclusive themes that came up in the, or that were defined in the landscape um, report. Uh, particularly those concepts of intentionality, reciprocity, and reflexivity. And we try to um, kind of just understand, um, or we asked about the participants' ex experiences with engagement, and we pulled out, you know, what we could find uh, in relevance to those themes about their engagement specifically, or about uh, the awards and how um, those components of their work, how they have or at least how they perceive them to have affected them getting their award. Uh, so the way we operationalize those um, concepts in, from our interviews and the way that we coded is that intentionality came through strategic goals. So we looked to the extent to which participants talked about strategic goals that they um, pursue or that they seek to achieve when they are communicating um, in their engagement efforts. Reciprocity was operationalized as two-way engagement, so the extent to which um, it is true engagement that uh, those awardees have had um, through their efforts. And reflexivity was through um, thinking about and assessing the engagement impact. So we were particularly interested in uh, those uh, elements as they appeared in the interviews or how they um, in the narratives uh, that were covered by the participants. Um, so the first one, the strategic goals, we noticed that participants had pre, you know, uh, goals that were predetermined uh, that they wanted to achieve when they communicate or when they engage with the public or with a particular target audience. And those goals uh, varied from um, trying to achieve benefits to self, such as through you know, making sense of the value of one's science or building partnerships with others, um, to benefits to science itself through advocating for science, increasing public trust, allowing people to appreciate science and its beauty, justify public funding came up, as well as to increase diversity and uh, visible science as to who can do science and the diversity in uh, scientists doing science, scientific work. Um, on the other end of the spectrum from benefits to self is benefits to communities. So those um, people had the goal of um, trying to reach someone who is not uh, reached by some other efforts, uh, trying to um, teach those who want to learn came up, or produce knowledgeable and ethical public that are able to make informed or scientifically informed decisions. Um, helping communities reach their own goals also came up. So you can see the, the kind of the dichotomy between um, the first uh, and, the, and this uh, category as well as benefiting society, especially vulnerable communities. So we tried to kind of profile uh, people who are more on the left side of the screen who have this uh, self uh, kind of planted in the way that they conduct their uh, engagement efforts and those who are on the far right who think about communities primarily. Um, and the profile that we found to, on the left is uh, mostly academics who perceive engagement as a peripheral component of their work. So they are mostly faculty and they do engagement, but it's not central to the work. They separate between those two personas. This is what I do for work and this is what I do for engagement. And those mostly had goals as to uh, benefit themselves or benefit science to some extent. On the other end are science communicators and academics who perceived engagement as central to their work. So they do not 
differentiate between the two. Uh, they perceive themselves as uh, their, their engagement work to be part of their research and teaching, and it's all kind of tied up together. It's not, um, they define themselves not as primarily faculty, but faculty who do this or science communicators who do this. Um, so th these two personas are basically what I'm going to uh, use for the remainder of um, this presentation to explain those concepts uh, that we looked for concerning inclusivity in science communication based on those two opposing uh, profiles or seemingly opposing uh, profiles. So in terms of strategic goals, I'll pull out um, uh, two quotes from someone who's doing public engagement as a central component of their work. Um, in, in this quote, you can see that, um, you know, it, from my experiences, uh, uh, this person said, um, I know the importance of seeing one's reflection. So I wanted to, um, to, to highlight, you know, this in my engagement effort. Uh, but then she pulls about the importance of why she perceives the importance of seeing reflection. So she says at one graduation ceremony, she had uh, some undergrads um, who wanted to take pictures of her. And she's like, you didn't even take a class with me. And they're like, yes, but knowing you were around made us feel better. So she is driven by this perception that me being here, doing this engagement work is important for others. Um, and that's her goal that's, uh, that's driving her. Whereas someone who's on the uh, the persona of mostly doing this on the peripheral, on the periphery rather than central part of their jobs, um, someone said. Um, so he's talking about um, an experience where they were. Um, so it finally, I guess, after seven or eight years of doing this lecture. Um, that had 35,000 in the audience, I decided it's time for me to quit. It's not growing, it's not changing. We need new blood. So I just walked away from it. It's like, it's still going. I haven't seen a show since. I just literally divorced myself. And that was a program that I got the award for. So you can see in the, you know, in the goals, like someone who's mostly driven by like, I'm not moving on, I'm not um, progressing. So it's time for me to leave, as opposed to someone who's like, no, this is part of my identity and why I'm doing all the work that I'm doing uh, for. So this is one way that um, you can see the difference between the two profiles. Moving on to the next concept, which is um, reciprocity that we operationalized as two-way engagement. Um, we also saw the same uh, dichotomy between those who do this work in a central way, part of their job. Um, this is a, a quote from someone who said, before when I was Professor X at uh, an Ivy League institution, I was mostly, don't tell me your story, I tell you so. So I think the gift is that I'm not at the university anymore and I don't have to prove how smart I am because that was really uh, a lot of my old job. And I think that now that I'm a science writer, um, a writer is all about listening and seeing. Um, so you can see that transitioning to um, outside of academia and, and building this central engagement part of um, the role that uh, this person was doing meant listening to others and true engagement as to, I, I don't want to display myself as smart as much as I want to listen to you and learn from you so that I know uh, what you need from me to offer. Um, on the other end of this is, um, Engagement, we should say that was valued by everyone, but the way engagement was misunderstood by this first group of, um, you know, people who are doing engagement on the periphery of their work is that they misunderstood it for things that we don't label really as engagement. For example, in this case, um, this person said uh, public engagement with science, the effort that they were doing certainly changed some things in the way I teach. So I made an effort to make my classes more engaging in some sense to make it more of a participation, not just lecturing, right? So we didn't really do that much in the shows, but the audience has certainly gotten involved in what was happening on stage by their applause, their hooting and hollering and the excitement that they had. And I decided that there must be some way to do the same thing in class. Um, so you can see that the understanding they have for engagement is not in this um, two-way engagement that people who were doing engagement as a central part of their job. Um, so that, that was another difference in the way engagement was practiced by the participants. 
Um, and the last one regarding impact, which is how we operationalize reflexivity, um, we noticed that every all the participants thought about impact, at least considered, you know, what is the impact of what I'm doing. Um, but those who do engagement as a central part of their work, uh, they cherish the impact. They build on those small anecdotes um, because it is difficult to measure impact, as all our participants agreed. But those anecdotes that they hear from people, um, they vary between cherishing them, um, as this example, um, I think it's worth it to just uh, read it quickly. So this person received a letter um, from someone who attended the biomedical engineering um, um, lecture, he, and that person fell in love with biomedical engineering after they had heard the lecture. Um, and he decided to take courses at a community college. Um, so I feel, and the way that this person described it is you ever play that game where the balloon is, the goal of the game is not for the balloon not to hit the ground. Um, like you're supposed to hit it before it gets to hit the ground. I feel like my hand was right there just before you hit the ground and I hit it back up. And it's such a beautiful way of, um, for us to understand the impact that she perceived, even with this one person's experience uh, who had written uh, to her, you can see that um, she cherishes it and she uses it as a driver for what she does afterwards. Whereas on the other end of the spectrum, we found people who do this on the periphery. Yes, they think about those anecdotes, um, but they downplay them in a way. Um, and this is one a good example. So the only anecdotal information I have is from a policewoman that didn't give me a ticket because she found out who I was. I was doing something related to the show and I told her I was doing so. She's like, oh, are you? And my daughter saw your show and she really had to become a scientist. And now she just graduated with a degree in engineering. Um, well, don't let this happen again. So he didn't get a ticket. Uh, but then he went on to say, it could be that her daughter was going to be an engineer no matter what, right? So this uh, perception that I could have made this impact or I could have you know, not necessarily have done it um, really speaks to, the, uh, to this concept that we were looking for as to how, what impact do you perceive for your work um, that drives you to do more of it? And you know you can see the dichotomy here in that one really thinks about this impact and is driven by it, and the other is like there may be an impact, there may be not. Um, I just do it to benefit you know other aspects of um, me or my science. Um, so this is in terms of the primary inclusive themes that we coded for, but we also you know we're talking about awards, so there's a lot of power themes that also jumped at us from the interviews um, that signified exclusivity and elitism in this uh, in the approach uh, for the awards. And we particularly found um, a theme of propagation of power through the awards for both, for the awardees and for the societies that I'd love to just quickly give you an overview uh, of now. So in terms of propagation of power through the awards for awardees, we see that um, you need some kind of pre-existing power to get those awards. Um, as one person puts it, there's a lot of gaming with awards. Um, so there's like a group of friends that are on tenure track professors that will decide this year, we're going to nominate this person. We're not going to run against that person, uh, which is you know problematic uh, because it, it frames awards in, as part of the same prestige system um, that we find in academia. Uh, so you need pre-existing power to get those awards somehow, especially as Rose had mentioned, most of those are by nomination. So you need someone to nominate you, you need a network. Um, but we also found that there were powers gained after or post receiving the awards. Um, for example, one person said, I would honestly credit every bit of success that I've had at this stage in my career to that organizational award uh, because of the visibility, because of the opportunities that they got. Um, this kind of like propagates the power from pre-existing one um, moving forward. There were definitely exceptions where people had to advocate for themselves. And this is, um, uh, 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 I think it's the same quote that you, Rose just uh, read portions of it in that you have to advocate for my for yourself I had to ask my chair to nominate me and as you can see here it wasn't comfortable it was uncomfortable in that space but it was um, 
kind of naturally occurred and made sense because she wanted this award. She, she felt she deserved it, but someone had to nominate her. Um, so there are definitely exceptions in that, um, you know, if you don't have a power network, you have to advocate, advocate for yourself, but this is definitely uncomfortable, uh, an uncomfortable position. Um, so on the other end, propagation of power uh, through awards, this time for societies. Um, so we saw how for awardees, the propagation of power is that you have to have some kind of pre-existing power to get nominated and then you get more power. For societies, um, it's, it was interesting that some of the recipients believe that awards seem to be for societies, not for the people who win them. Uh, particularly when awards are granted for famous people, it's like adding luster to your prize, as someone, um, one of the participants had put it. Uh, another theme that came up is that awards are one way for societies to practice their power. Um, you know, giving this one token per year and having a bunch of people compete over it. Um, it's, you know, it's a way of practicing power. It's a way for societies to show um, their positions and their powers and that, you know, the more exclusive it is to get this award, the more, the higher it is uh, in ranking as how important that award is and the more um, importance that society has gained. So this perception was also there. And a very interesting theme that we found is that powers are also practiced post-awards by society. So it's not even only in the uh, nomination and selection phase, even after people receive those awards, uh, society seemed to practice some kind of power in that, you know, you have to behave in this kind of way. So we had one example in our sample where that person was threatened for the award to be taken away from them um, because there was some kind of social media blowout and um, the award uh, committee and or the society involved in giving that award, like, you know, we're not going to invite you to the award ceremony. And if you don't put, put it together, we're going to retract this award from you. So it's a way of like fully practicing power over uh, the recipients. Um, which brings us to the question that, you know, we are interested in. We were mainly driven in, in this research. Um, are awards drivers for engagement generally, but also specifically for inclusive engagement? And we, we, you know, our conclusion is that it depends. Um, and I'm going to take you back to the, to the, to this difference whether engagement is occurring as a central part of someone's uh, work or if it's on the peripheral. And so, when engagement is central, um, it seems that participants valued their engagement work um, and the engagement awards more. Uh, so when they perceive that this is a central part of my job, they perceive the awards as higher value. Um, and not only that, but they support others who are doing engagement. Uh, so they, it's kind of like they pay it forward by offering support for others who are doing engagement. Um, and uh, this quote Emily had in her, um, and her part about the impact, but it speaks to, to how awards can potentially drive people to, to do engagement and that because there's no North Star in science communication, so do this list of awards of what you can attain to basically prove yourself or to say, I'm doing important work, um, this can drive you to, to, to get to places and to do certain kind of engagement. So we did find this theme um, especially through those who are doing engagement as a central component of their work. Um, but also the, this group of uh, scientists, they also agree that there, this may not be enough to change the academic culture. So to go to academic institutions and say, hey, I got this important award from this society because of the engagement work that I'm doing, um, it may be important for that person, but it's, it, it's not clear how that the culture is going to change just because societies are offering such awards. Um, and also along the same line of, you know, this uh, paying it forward and that the generation before has to help the generation behind us. So if we make it in this public engagement uh, work that we're doing, we should look after those who are coming after us and try to support them in any way uh, we can. So this is under the, those who do work in a central, uh, way. Those who do engagement in a peripheral way, however, um, even when they receive this rec recognition, 
um, they do not necessarily um, appreciate the impact of the award as much. Um, they're more cynical about it. And they also do not necessarily support the engagement paths of others. And there's this quote that um, I wanted to highlight. So the award validates people that see this as being important and plays a role. But my salary comes from the physics research I do primarily and teaching secondary. And this doesn't really play into my salary all and never did. Maybe the sad part is that when I'm asked to review people and they think that they can get promoted based on this. And that's, um, it's important for us to do this if we are having the capabilities of doing it well, but it shouldn't be required. And you shouldn't think that your whole career can be as a university professor based on this. Uh, if you don't have the research, you're not going to be promoted at an R1. And I think that's proper. So it like, and this person is very achieved in public engagement or the, the way that, you know, um, they, they did, um, their engagement efforts, but they did it in a peripheral way. They, they defined themselves as primarily academics and this is just something we do besides it. Um, so th these are the two profiles that we mainly found and, and the discrepancy and the views that they uh, see the work, the engagement work and the inclusiveness in this um, work. So I want to leave you with like some questions that we can ponder on in the breakout rooms as well as um, afterwards in the discussion. Uh, can awards motivate scientists to do public more public engagement? Can awards drive more inclusive public engagement? And more importantly, how can awards themselves become more inclusive? And I want to leave you with um, a quote from one of our uh, participants who had this uh, doing engagement as a central part of their work. Um, it, it speaks a lot about, you know, um, when you're offering those awards, it's not enough to motivate faculty to do certain things that are aligned with what you want them to do. I think probably you'll end up capturing those faculty that are already doing that work and are already committed. Um, so it, feed, it feeds into the same prestige system um, and it's like grants, right? You get one and then it's easier for you to get more of them. Um, so the, the statement that is highlighted is that we need to try and elevate the work of people who are doing, um, who are, are people who are doing, we should do it um, in ways that are more inclusive. Um, and so we don't want, how can we do this uh, without feeding into the same system of Frankism and prestige in academia? Um, so with that, we're, I'm going to, pass it on back to Rose, who's going to introduce the breakout rooms. And um, we're looking forward to see what y'all have to say about this. <laughs>